It's been a few weeks since we've uh, dived into our study of Genesis, so we're coming back to Genesis, this sermon series titled The Foundations for Life. What we've seen in Genesis so far in these opening chapters in the creation of this world, the creation of man and woman, the, the first marriage between Adam and Eve, we're seeing God's design being played out for how he has designed this world to operate. And now we come to chapter three, a well-known chapter. Many of us are familiar with this chapter where we see sin enter and the brokenness and the curse on this world play out. We're going to spend several weeks here in chapter three, not just because we love misery and, and depression and thinking about sin, but because there are some essential truths that spring from this chapter that lay a foundation for how we understand what Jesus does for us, our relationship with God, how we live today as followers of Christ. These are essential truths if we want to be faithful followers of Christ. So I invite you, if you are able, to stand with me for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and all-sufficient word. This morning we are reading Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is a well known military strategy know your enemy. Various victories in battle have been won because of. A wise, prudent, intelligent general is studying the tactics of their enemy. It even plays out in sports. From week to week, these sporting teams watching videotape of, it's not called videotape anymore, is it? <laughs> Whatever it is, video of their opponents that they're about to face to watch their strengths, their weaknesses. How can they exploit these weaknesses and gain an advantage in this struggle for victory? Well, it certainly applies for you and me in our understanding of our own enemy. Know your enemy. As you see in your bulletin on page three, Mark Jones wrote a book called Knowing Sin. Subtitle, is seeing a neglected doctrine through the eyes of the Puritans. He calls this doctrine of knowing sin a neglected doctrine. This popular day and age, it is well talked of, well known, that people don't like to talk about sin. In fact, I hear, and I've not yet been in one of these churches, but I hear that there are churches that will not use the word sin in their vocabulary. We must know it. Mark Jones says, and this I don't think is an exaggerated statement. He says, knowing, other than knowing God, our greatest advocate, nothing else in this world is more important than knowing sin, your greatest enemy. Christians should know that a proper understanding of grace requires a thorough grasp of sin. A distorted, weak view of sin will lead to a disfigured, anemic, and unproductive theology. And if I could add to that statement, and I think Mark Jones 
would agree, without knowing sin, we are all the more susceptible to be ensnared in sin. We need to know our enemy in order to overcome our enemy. And that's why we're going to take a few weeks looking at Genesis 3 and this introduction of sin into this world and how sin came in and how we might understand the nature of temptation and sin so that we might battle faithfully against our enemy. Now, sin is our enemy, but you might be thinking, well, we have another enemy of our soul, the enemy of our church, Satan himself. And here in Genesis 3, we read that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, and then the serpent speaks. We believe that this is Satan appearing in the form of a, sa of a serpent, of a snake, in order to deceive and, and lead astray Adam and Eve away from their God. Revelation 12, 9 even identifies Satan as this serpent. Revelation 12, 9, we read, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Jesus identifies Satan as the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. And so this is Satan here in the garden attacking God's good creation. We're going to do a, a brief side note. And I'll try to keep this brief because you read Genesis, you don't hear anything about the fall of Satan. How did Satan become Satan? When did he become a deceiver? Why is he coming into the garden and sowing seeds of doubt about God's word and God's promises. Where did this come from? There are two passages in scripture that Bible scholars have frequently come back to and understood that these are passages speaking about Satan and how he became who he was. Now, these passages are disputed, but I do believe that they do speak about Satan. The first one is in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 is a prophecy about the prince of Tyre. Tyre was a city on the coast of the Mediterranean, north of Israel, a major seaport for trade and commerce. And Tyre is often equated with this oppressive city that looked down upon and, in fact, harmed Israel. And so this prophecy opens up with this attack or, or warning of judgment against the prince of Tyre. But then verse 11 of Ezekiel 28, the language turns. And this is where Bible scholars, they read this and they hear this language and say, this is no mortal man. Like the prince of Tyre might think really highly of himself. He might think that he's something great and significant, but something changes here in the language. First of all, it goes from the prince of Tyre to the king of Tyre. And so why the, the change from prince to king? And perhaps this is a window into how satanic beings and, and demons work behind the scenes of leading nations and cities and governments contrary to God's will. So it opens up. Verse 11 here, Ezekiel 28, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. Now listen to the, the language speak, spoken of the king of Tyre. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. 
That's a magnificent description. And if that is a human, it is, seems improbable. For we know that the teaching of Scripture is that every human, as David testifies in Psalm 51, we are conceived in sin. We are born under the curse of sin. We are not created in perfection and blameless in all of our ways. We're born in sin, only Adam and Eve. And so either he's speaking about Adam or Eve, or he's speaking about Jesus Christ, who is the only other human born blameless in all his ways, or he's speaking about Satan and calling him a cherub, a guardian cherub, and that he was in the Eden, the Garden of Eden at the beginning, and that he was the most beautiful, magnificent, perfect being in the garden seems to lend all of this towards, this is Satan. And then Ezekiel continues, recording the words of God, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. The other passage that is often spoken of in regards to Satan and the fall of Satan is Isaiah chapter 14. Once again, it speaks about a human king. This is a judgment, a warning against Babylon and the king of Babylon. There literally was a king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. We know his name. He came and destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. But the language turns here from an ordinary judgment on an ordinary human king to something elevated and magnificent, something out of this world. In Isaiah 14, verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the earth. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you were brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. This exalted arrogance of this king reflects the work of Satan. How did Satan become Satan? It's pride. His arrogance, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 both speak about this. His pride, his arrogance. I will ascend. I will sit. I will arise. I will be like the most high. I will put myself above all. Somewhere between Genesis 131 where God saw all of that he created and said it was very good. And Genesis 3, 1, Satan in his arrogance fell. And as Isaiah 14, 12 says, he fell from the heavens. Many believe Jesus quotes this in Luke chapter 12 after the 70 disciples go out and they return. He says, how I have seen Satan fall from heaven. Satan falls. He loses his place of glory. He loses his place of influence and honor before God. And he is a fallen creature and now the deceiver of the nations and the world. It's a bit of an introduction and we could say more about Satan, but I want to focus on the nature of temptation and sin that we see here. So the serpent comes in. This is Satan somewhere. We don't know how long the timeline passes here between Genesis 2.25 and Genesis 3.1. Was it a day? Was it a week? Was it a month? Was it a year? Was it a thousand years? I doubt it was a thousand years. That's my own personal opinion because I think they would start having children pretty quickly, Adam and Eve. 
but it records they don't have children until after the fall. So it's, I don't think it was a very long time, but we still don't know how long. And Satan comes in and he deceives Eve, leads Eve and Adam astray. They both fall into sin. And with the way Satan tempts Adam and Eve gives us a window into the nature of temptation. Every temptation reflects these two dynamics. There's two dynamics we have in this text about, tem about temptation. Number one, every temptation undercuts the goodness of God. Every temptation undercuts the goodness of God. Another way of saying it is every temptation sows the seed of doubt about God's goodness. We see it in the serpent's question, verse 1. Did God actually say, did this really get said? Is this really God's design? Is this God's intention? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. So it's not only sowing that doubt, it twists the truth of what God said. What did God say? We can look back in chapter 2, verse 16. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The serpent twists that and says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Just throwing shade, as my kids would say, throwing shade on God and his word. The, God's not... God's withholding good things from you. God is withholding blessing from you. God is, is tyrannizing you. He is, he's not giving you any good blessings here. He's holding back. That is the first dynamic of temptation. Every temptation undercuts the goodness of God, raises doubts, clouds, creates a shadow on our understanding of God's goodness and what God has for us. So take any command. Thou shall not steal. Any command. What temptation does with a command like thou shall not steal is to raise the seed of doubt that God is actually wanting you to live in poverty. God wants you to, to live in discomfort. God wants you to suffer because he's going to keep you away from getting what you want. And he's drawing a line. Don't steal. You can't have that. I'm blocking you from that. That's the nature of temptation. Do not commit adultery. This desire for sexual pleasure it's that seed of doubt that God is withholding good pleasure from you, withholding something that is enjoyable from you and saying that God wants to ruin your life. He's restrictive. That's how temptation works. Every temptation starts with that dynamic of undercutting the goodness of God. Derek Kidner in his Bible commentary also notes that in this temptation, in this dynamic of the temptation of undercutting the goodness of God, you're elevating yourself. You're placing yourself in this place of judgment over the word of God. I'm going to decide what the word of God means. I'm going to decide what God's intentions are behind his word. So there's this reversal of role going on behind this, undercutting the goodness of God. Well, Eve responds in verse 2, correcting the serpent. She says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. That's what God says. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. In verse 3, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Which is true, God said that, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst, middle of the garden, you shall not eat. 
But then she adds an extra flare. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. This is the introduction of human religion. We are going to make more restrictions. We are going to go above and beyond. We are going to establish our own boundaries so that we could look good before God. I don't know how Adam or Eve came to that conclusion or why Eve in that moment says we shall not even touch it. Perhaps Adam instructed his wife in the days after the prohibition saying, hey, we're not supposed to eat of that. So, you know, just to protect us, let's not even touch it. Let's not even like feel it and see how mm, juicy they feel. Let's not even touch that fruit. Of the, it's like, let's protect ourselves. It's good intentions, but it becomes this new legalism, a new barrier, new, new human effort of what are we going to achieve and accomplish for God. But then the serpent replies. And here in verse four, we see the second dynamic of temptation. The first one is undercutting the goodness of God. The second dynamic is making a false promise. Making a false promise. Every temptation undercuts the goodness of God and makes a false promise. Verse, verse 4, the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. He makes more than one promise. That's number one continues, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So two promises Satan makes here. You will not die. It's a denial of judgment. It's, it's from the beginning how often do we want to deny judgment? It's really not going to be that bad for you. You're really not going to get punished. You know, sin is really not that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. We're just, you're not going to get punished for this. God doesn't care. God, God loves everyone. He's not going to judge anyone. The whole idea of denying judgment is from the very beginning. And this is Satan's work, even in temptation. The first doctrine of scripture that is denied is judgment. And then the second promise that he makes is you will be like God. It says knowing good and evil. A lot of people have wrestled with what does that mean, knowing good and evil? And I think the, the best explanation I read from Bruce Walke is that this is speaking about you are placing yourself in the position to determine what is good and and evil. Because Adam doesn't have to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to know that disobeying God is not a good thing. You don't have to experience it to know it. Just like we could teach you about a, a human disease. Thinking off the, off the cuff here, I'm trying to not gross people out. We don't want to do toenail fungus. <laughs> Cardiac disease, coronary heart disease. What is the proper name there? Hardening of the artia, arteries. Oh my gosh. <laughs> heart attack. <laughs> I have never had a heart attack. Praise God. My dad did when he was 59 years old, one month before I was married. He had a heart attack. He had to go into surgery right away. And they put in a stent in his artery because there was, the artery was closing. You guys are familiar with this. Hardening of the arteries, cholesterol buildup. They had to have a stent put in. One of our pastors in our presbytery, Tim Elliott, assistant pastor at New Hope, had a heart attack a week and a half ago. And he had five stents put into his heart. We could understand that. You don't have to have a heart attack to know a heart attack is bad. Now understand that whatever that technical term is, cholesterol buildup in your arteries and hardening of the arteries that leads to a heart attack, you don't have to experience that to know it's bad. And so eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not 
there to help Adam know what is evil. He knows what is evil, disobeying God in this moment. But what it reveals, what it does, is put Adam and Eve in that place to, to determine what is good and evil. Supplanting God in his role. I will determine for myself what is good and evil. And this is what it means to be like God. The only problem is when we do that, we fail miserably. So these are the two dynamics of temptation. It undercuts the goodness of God and it, it makes these false promises. I call them false promises because... Adam and Eve are judged. They immediately know the experience, the effects of sin. We're going to save that for next week, talking about the, the corruption and misery of sin. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. We know that. We know that experience of the, the, the effects of sin. They are under judgment. They are cast out of Eden. They lose their fellowship with God. They immediately are ashamed. And they are not like God. For they do not live forever. They are never going to be a creator. They are never going to be in a place of holy justice to judge the created world. They do not achieve the things that Satan promises. Well, temptation leads to to sin. I want to look briefly at what is the nature of sin and what do we learn from this passage. You might be familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 14, asks the question, what is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto, want being lack of, any lack of conformity unto or transgression of God's law. It's either failing to conform to what God commands us to do or directly transgressing, breaking the commands that God gives us. And so Adam and Eve do not conform to God's desire to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They actually transgress this command. That's what sin is. But I want to look at what is the heart of, behind that transgression, that lack of conformity unto God's law. Look at verse six with me. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So the the temptation tantalizing before her led her into the sin. I've already hinted at the nature of sin here and just talking about the temptation. It is supplanting God. That is the nature of sin. Supplanting God. Taking the place of God. I will determine for myself what is good and evil. I will set myself above God, be the judge of what is good and what God is designed to do, I will seek to control my destiny. We hear it in Isaiah 14 with the description of Satan. It's repeated multiple times. I will, I will, I will, I will. That is the nature of sin. James Montgomery Boyce, a pastor at 10th Pres in Philadelphia, has said it like this in Genesis, his studies on Genesis. It is placing my will over God's will for my life. That is sin. Placing my will over God's will in my life. Christopher Walken, in his book, Biblical Critical Theology, Biblical critical th theory, let me say that right. Talking about sin and the nature of sin, and he says sin is autonomy. And what he's saying there is that sin is this desire to be apart from God, do not submit to God. I want to 
Choose my own course. It's the same thing that James Montgomery Boyce is saying, the same thing that we're hitting on, the nature of this. I'm going to place myself in the place of authority. I'm going to place myself, my assessment, over against God. That is the nature of sin. Again, Kinder commenting on this. When Eve takes the fruit and eats of it and gives to her husband, she has just placed herself, the creature, over the creator. She has just placed her impressions, what she, through sensory information, took in, that it was pleasing to the sight, it was good to eat. She placed her impressions over against God's instructions. And she elevated her own self-fulfillment. There is that, that change, that switch, Choosing what she believes is the good for her. And she pursues that and makes that her goal. This is the nature of sin. So if you take in the nature of temptation, these two dynamics, undercutting the goodness of God, the false promises made, the nature of sin is placing my will over against God's will, what do we do? How do we battle? How do we fight? What is the faithful daily Christian living? I'm going to take a note from John Owen and his tactics. John Owen was a Puritan pastor in the 17th century. Some consider one of the greatest theologians in the English language. And others say one of the hardest theologians to read in the English language. But he wrote a whole book on Temptation, the nature of temptation. And he begins with Jesus' instruction. And I'm going to end with Jesus' instruction here, our sermon. This is the battle, the nature of the battle. Jesus says in Matthew 26, 41, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. I almost said the Garden of Eden. He's not there. Garden of Gethsemane. The night he is about to be betrayed, he's there with his disciples. His soul is in anguish. He is praying. He asks his disciples to pray with him. He comes back to them and finds them sleeping. He wakes them up and he says in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray that you may not enter into into temptation. Those two words, watch and pray, summarize the nature of the battle. How do we fight temptation? How do we steer away and avoid sin? This life of sin. These two words, watch and pray. To watch is in comparison with the nature of temptation. What is the nature of temptation? Undercutting the goodness of God, making false promises. If we're going to be diligent, we are going to be paying attention. We are going to be looking out for things that are undercutting the goodness of God, things that are making false promises in our lives. And a big part of that is being well familiar with, 